Hi there, I have a letter cast here. You may know me from my stories, you may know me from YouTube, you may know me from your local coffee shop, or maybe you don't know me at all. Regardless of how our paths have crossed, I just want to say, welcome to my podcast. This podcast is for any listeners looking to expand their support for small name creators and discover tomorrow's bestsellers today. In each episode, I introduce you to new indie authors from a wide range of genres in fiction and nonfiction, as well as graphic novels and webcomics. Each episode features a new author. Learn about their works and subscribe for a chance to receive a copy of our next interviewee's book completely free. I will be posting a new episode on the first Friday or Saturday of every month, and you can find me on whatever platform you use to listen to your podcasts. Each episode will also be available in video format on YouTube, in text format on my blog at iLettercast.com, and if you want the links to all of those, just subscribe to my weekly newsletter at iLettercast.com. Hi there, and welcome to another episode of Indie Author Connection. Today, on the sixth episode um, of our Indie Author Connection podcast, today uh, we're going to be interviewing Katie Inojosa, who has been writing in the thriller and suspense genre for five years, and Hashtag Hunted Lives is her debut novel. So, Katie, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself to the audience and tell us a little bit about your story. Hi, JB. Thank you, first of all, for having me here and on your podcast. I appreciate it. I, when we first met on, uh, through Adam Hogue's webinar, I was very impressed by your drive and your initiative. And to do some, take something like this on is pretty impressive. So thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, um, you know, we didn't get to engage too terribly much Um but I really appreciate that I made an impression. <laughs> you did, you did, you did. Awesome. As far as me, I, um, well, I've always loved writing and uh, creative writing and, and, you know, writing through the years. However, when I went to college, I took a logic track and studied computer science. Oh. And so most of my career, I was writing technically, uh, technical papers. I was a business analyst and quality assurance expert for websites, mostly financial. So on the business analyst side, I would do uh, write the requirements for whatever feature we were adding in, for example, transferring funds. And, um, and wow. my job was to document all of the requirements, everything from the color of the pages to how it flows from page to page to page to the fields that are on the page and what, is, what can be entered into each field, error messages, the back end, you know, making sure that for a transfer, that a closed account can't transfer funds, for example, things, you know, all of those kinds of rules had to be applied. And in the technical world, um, you have to be very exact and so that everyone reads the, re the requirements the same way. There's no um, confusion. No room and for so, interpretation or anything. Exactly, like exactly. And then on the quality assurance side, uh, once the business requirements were documented and approved, they would go to the developers who would write the code and my job from the quality assurance perspective was to test every aspect of it to make sure that they coded it the way the requirements were written. So that's what I did most of my career. And I loved it. It was a lot of fun. Um, when I retired, I retired at 48. I, uh, those creative juices kind of started flowing again. It's like, mm, maybe I need to start writing. And my husband actually saw it before me. And he suggested I take an online how to write a great novel kind of uh, course just to kind of refresh my memory on things, to teach me things I didn't know. And it was a lot of fun and it got those juices going. And my husband and I for, a, for four years lived in Myrtle Beach, but we would come back and forth to Texas to uh, visit our kids and grandkids. And when we get in a car, uh, we're the type of people that we go and we go until we get there. You know, we don't dilly dally. We don't stop and read history, historical markers. We want to get there. So it's like a 19 or 20 hour drive. <laughs> so we would do it all in one pop. Wow. And, just in one go, huh? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> and my husband drove most of the way, but right in the middle for like a two hour period, I would drive so he could nap the rest of the time he was driving. And that gave me a whole bunch of time to figure out, especially with this story, the story that I wanted to write, where I wanted to go. Um, how to make it all work together and, and, and just how, the, how it would happen. And, and it, so it was a lot of fun doing that and seeing the book and the idea come together um, was, was a lot of fun. And it took, that was in 2015 when I first started thinking of the idea, mm -hmm. um, started writing kind of in 2016, 
got pretty much got the first draft done. Um, the, the first draft was pretty fast. What took a long time was all of the editing. <laughs> and um, I took a year off in 2017 because we built a house in Texas and moved back. And so, um, so yeah, so it's, I, those creative juices kind of just kind of took over and said, you got to write. That is really cool. You have a really <laughs> like interesting story. Like if you don't mind, I'm going to go off script for a second here. That's fine. That's so fine. You started working on this particular story in 2016. Mm-hmm. Started and actually writing. Did you have the title in mind at that point in time or did it kind of develop over the years? Mm-hmm. Um, I think pretty much I, I knew I, I think the, the 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 idea and the title pretty much came right at the start. Okay. I knew that it was going to be that I wanted to combine social media. That's that's the hashtag. And I knew that this was going to be um, about a game called the hunted ones. Mm-hmm. And so and you can actually my sister said, you know, is it, is it hunted lives or hunted lives? You know, it could be either oh, way. Yeah. I, you know, <laughs> so I didn't even, that's interesting. Um, yeah. I didn't I even know. think to read it I, as lives. Yeah. Yes. And it can be interpreted either way. I mean, if, if the hunted lives kind of, and that was my original thought, hunted lives, mm-hmm. was that it refers to the hunted one's game being alive via this real game I where see. people are being murdered. Hunted lives referred to the, refers to the people who are being hunted. And, you know, do they live or don't they? That's really cool. Um, so that's actually so a lot of the people that I've interviewed, they're like, I knocked my first draft out in like six weeks and then I got everything already and it's only been a year and I'm like published and let's do this. I used to be that way. That was mm-hmm. how I felt like I wanted to publish my stuff. But mm-hmm. as I've really started working on sort of like my baby, if you will, uh, in terms of what I've been writing, I'm realizing that this particular story that I've been working on, not Arachnopocalypse, because that's different. Mm-hmm. But, um, Revolution Ascending is going to be taking, you know, a couple mm-hmm. of years to really get fully fleshed yeah. out. And I really like stories that take that time. You know, James Patterson is an example of an author who can just, he can knock them out, man. He does contracts with other authors too, but like yes. he knocks out several in a year and they're out there already. But the ones that take time and like they slow, slow cook, if you will, Mm -hmm. I think Mm -hmm. those sometimes tend to be like the richer, the richer stories. It amazes me how people can crank them out. I mean, wow. I mean, I'm (laughs) I'm astounded and amazed. Yeah. Part part of this period of time for me was also, I originally was going to try the traditional publishing route. Mm-hmm. And so I sent out query letters and, and did some of that stuff. And I went to some, some seminars and talked to some agents and stuff. And ultimately I decided, you know, cause you have to get an agent first these days, you can't send it to a publishing house. And yeah. ultimately I decided I, that I wanted the control. You know, I want to be the one who decides what my book cover looks like, not anyone else, you know, that sort of thing. And, um, and so I decided to go the self publishing route, which opened up a whole new area of things to learn. OMG. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> wow. <laughs> so I'm, this one has been a little smoother just because I, you know, at least I know certain, I know about self publishing now. You know, so, so this next one's moving faster from that perspective. <laughs> so you've already got another one in the works as well. The sequel. Ooh. Okay. All right. Well, let's, let's talk. I'm excited about that. I'm going to hold on to that here. Okay. Um, but as an author, like, do you have a goal with your books, you know, like, or do you have something that kind of drives and inspires you to put it out there? Or is it more of just like, I had the story in here and I need to get it out. (laughs) What is it for you? I I think I want first, when I first started doing this, it's like, I want to publish a book, you know, and that was my only goal. I didn't think too much about anything else. I certainly didn't think about marketing or anything. I just wanted to publish a book. But now that it, you know, now that it's out there, it's like I, I want to entertain people first and foremost. And uh, you know, this is nothing. This is no, you know, deep kind of. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's not a deep kind of uh, story. It's, it's, and it's, it's an entertainment piece, you know. And, um, and. But it's also touches on an area that is a concern to me. So I think part of the reason why I write is as I kind of slide in something that's um, important to me. In this case, you know, there are so many positive aspects of social media. And to me, the original intent was to connect people. You know, I've mm-hmm. connected with high school friends that I would never have, would never have done otherwise, you know, and things like that. It's pretty cool, but it's kind of morphed. 
over time. And uh, yeah. it's become something, some of the negative aspects are really becoming apparent to me. And so this book really amplifies the negative aspects of social media. Okay, that's really <laughs> cool. I um, actually very much agree <laughs> with that stance. In, uh, in some of my classes in college, we're talking about like, you know, this is psychology, right? So it's like, mm -hmm. What are, you know, people always want to be like, oh, you know, social media is so good and it's so healthy. And it's like, actually, there's a lot going on with social media that's affecting people's mental health. Um, you know, you have higher rates of depression, feelings of isolation, bullying is increased. So there's there's that definitely if a person's going to be using social media, there's like that balance you have to have. Well, and people say and do things on social media they would never, never do face to face. Yep. And it's changed the whole way we communicate. I mean, you go into a restaurant and I can see four people sitting at a table all with their noses down on their in their in their iPhones or whatever device they have yep. instead of talking to the people they're in front of. You know, we it's changed the way people communicate. And, um, and that all contributes to the depression and that kind of stuff because people aren't talking face to face or even phone, yeah. um, voice, voice very often uh, or as much as they used to anymore. And, you know, that affects people. So how do you incorporate that into your story? Well, the story, um, um, various people are being killed in different cities across the states using different weapons. And the murders are being broadcast on oh. um, social media. Okay. And the public loves it. They are like cheering it on. It's like, wow, you know, I want to be a part of it. How do I get to be a part of it? So from that aspect, it's, 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 it's it addresses how people are kind of numbed to what's what reality might be. And so some people even in the book, some of, some of the comments that people are making as they're watching this murder occur or see the video after the fact, whatever, they're saying, you know, is this even real? I mean, come on, it's just a show, you know? So it's just kind of ties all of that kind of in to, um, to the story um, and with the game. I love how morbid that is. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, it's I love, I, you know, I do my other podcast, uh, the Grim Dark Book Club. Like I love mm -hmm. if it's like, morbid and grim and like like people are like egging the stuff on and you're like oh my god but they don't yes. even get like how real it is yes. that is peak right there that's awesome <laughs> so we kind of already touched a little bit on what hunted mm -hmm. live hashtag hunted lives is about mm -hmm. um but do you have uh could you maybe go in a little bit more in depth of like your world and your characters um sure, and the plot? sure. the main protagonist is molly hooper She's an intelligence analyst for the FBI. And she comes from a very, very wealthy family who have certain expectations of their children, of their mm -hmm. girls. And she defied that and joined the FBI. And she you know, didn't want to be told who to marry and who the right person was to marry and you know, all that kind of stuff. I love her and right. so she, <laughs> she's kind of defied them over time. And she, um, uh, she is teamed up with an agent, a special agent named Jacob Black, who is this, you know, hard hitting. He used to be in the army and, you know, he's out in the field a lot and, uh, they're brought together when an undercover agent is murdered. And, um, the initial thought is that he was murdered because of his undercover work and agent Jacob Black blames her because he thinks her, her analysis that sent him there was faulty. And, um, and she, but she starts digging a little deeper and, and realizes that this undercover agent is tied to, she believes, um, a housewife in New York who was also killed. And there were just a few similarities. There was no con apparent connection. In fact, there's no connection between any of the, of the victims, but she, there were things that were triggering her mind saying that, that there's gotta be a connection. Something more is going on here. And so they discover that um, uh, the victims all have a medically precise cut behind their ear and um, uh, a, a calling card is left on their chest when they're killed. So that sends them down this path trying to figure out what the heck is going on. And because yeah, no one's, re nothing's related, different weapons, different cities. I mean, and so they stumble on what happens and, and, and what's, what's behind it all, which sends them down. And I don't, I don't know if, if I want to get into the specifics of what they discover, 
but um, it leads them down the path that, that ultimately they realize kind of what's happening. And towards the end of the book, Molly herself becomes a target of this, uh, this game. That's awesome. So, how does she survive? <laughs> if she survives. <laughs> and you mentioned you'd be, you'd be open to reading a little bit of the book. Um, yeah, is that sure. still a thing you want to do? Sure. Awesome. I, <laughs> I don't typically go for thriller types. Oh, that's a really mm -hmm. good one too. Oh, I don't right. typically go for like thriller types of books. I used to read a lot when I was a kid. Um, mm -hmm. And the problem for me is everything tends to be so predictable, but like you, okay. So you like, they've got like a medically precise cut behind their ear. And I'm like, what kind of medically precise like <laughs> what does it mean does like it I mean? don't know where that's gonna go I love yes. it yes and if you know if you like it, someone um asked me you know do um you know um, he he said he tends to read a, a young man that I met he said I tend to read more fantasy and more sci-fi kind of stuff and I said well do you like social media and he said yes and I do I do you play app games he said all the time and then you're gonna like this book yeah <laughs> So, okay, so, well, how about if I read the first scene of the first chapter? That sounds lovely. It's just a few pages long. Chapter one, New York City, Thursday, March 5th, 3.10 a.m. She cowered in the corner of the Stone Cottage Ladies' Restroom near the open-air Delacourt Theater in Central Park, crying and depleted by hunger, exhaustion, and fear. Her long blonde hair was matted and tangled. She wore only a dirty black I Love New York sweatshirt, no bra, baggy black exercise pants, and frayed red tennis shoes. A light snow blanketed the path in fairy tale beauty, making this run for her life all the more surreal. Shivering uncontrollably, her bones ached from the cold. Shallow breathing matched the pounding in her head and racing heartbeat. Terrified eyes ringed black by fatigue dominated an ashen face. Grabbing onto the wall for support and inching her way up, she limped to the sink. Hoping to steal some warmth from the water, she turned on the faucet and splashed her face. No luck. Gasping for air and teeth chattering, she wiped her eyes on the sleeve of the sweatshirt. Her nightmare began three days ago when she was abducted. She had popped over to the grocery store near her home in Newark, New Jersey, to buy a special treat for her older daughter who was homesick with the flu. Returning to the parking lot, she noticed an older gentleman in his 60s leaning against a black windowless van, gripping his chest, grimacing and wheezing. Alarmed, she rushed over to ask if he was all right. He shook his head. As she reached for her, this, her cell phone to call 911, the van's sliding door opened and a large muscular man grabbed her while the man outside shoved her in, slamming the door and disappearing as the van raced away. On the floor of the van, the man knelt on her legs, reached for a syringe on the console between the front and passenger seat and plunged it into the base of her neck. That was the last thing she remembered. Awareness came slowly to her, a musty stale smell bringing her fully awake. She was lying on her back on a lumpy sofa in her underclothes. Turning her head toward a squeaking sound, she shrieked and pushed herself into a sitting position as a rat scurried away. Groaning in pain, her fingers gingerly probed the area behind her ear. Feeling a sticky wetness, she pulled her hand back and observed with horror the blood staining her fingers. She raised her hand to her head again and touched what felt like stitches. The wound was about three fingers wide and blood was oozing out. What had happened? Looking cautiously around, she assessed her surroundings. The sofa was the single piece of furniture in the room, barely fitting. Standing up and stretching her arms out shoulder height, her fingers almost touched the walls on each side. There were no windows and the only light was a thin beam of sunlight shining in from an opening at one end. She crept to the opening and peeked outside. Shock crossed her face, her mouth dropping open slightly. She was in a shipping container in a yard full of containers. Pushing, door, pushing the door wider for light, she turned back to the interior, noticing for the first time the filthy clothes lying next to a note and picture of her family on the floor. In disbelief and with a growing sense of panic, she had read the note, alternately staring at the picture of her family. Without wasting any time, she addressed and fled. On the run now for 16 hours, could she make it another 56? She thought about her girls now, picturing their sweet smiles. She and her husband, Joe, had started their family later in life. At the age of 42, six short years ago, her precious Becky was born. Jamie followed three years later. They were her pride and joy, her life. Thinking of them gave her the impetus to keep going. She had to survive for them. 
She took a drink of water from the faucet and closed her eyes, filling her lungs with air to try to calm herself with the breathing exercises she had learned in yoga. It didn't work. It felt as though an elephant sat on her chest, every breath a struggle, the pressure immobilizing her. I can do this. I have to do this. I can survive 72 hours for my girls. Preparing to leave, she ch chanted this mantra over and over in her head, determination giving her focus and strength. She peered out the restroom door and skimmed the area looking for movement, straining to hear any noise out of the ordinary. It was still and quiet. Time to make a move. Trembling, she stepped outside the restroom and over the black rail lining the pathway, then crept to the corner of the building. A bitter breeze hit her in the face as she looked around the corner. A few snow flurries were drifting down from the sky. Sunrise was still a few hours away, but she'd have more protection on West Drive where traffic was picking up. Not seeing anyone or hearing anything, she crouched low and tiptoed through the brush to the path that would take her to the street. Stepping over another black rail onto the path, she took a deep breath, then half limped and half ran toward the street. She didn't make it 10 steps. The bolt slammed into her chest, a direct hit to her heart, the force of it sending her sprawling onto her back. She was dead before she hit the ground. That's the first scene. <laughs> so as you were reading that, I was thinking, man, I, so for a second, I thought you were cutting into the protagonist, like after the fact, you're going to do like, mm -hmm. a, you know, three days earlier, jump back in time. But like, as you're going, I'm like, this person is, is like a victim. <laughs> that was yeah. really good. I really, really enjoyed that. I liked I think my favorite part, I really like your description, like the way that you describe things. I could Thank see you. the shipping container, you know, from the inside with the, mm -hmm. the beam of light, you know. And, yeah, oh good. Uh, good. That last description of like, it hit her boom in the chest. Like that was, that was really good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It was a fun book. I mean, it's, it's, you know, pretty gruesome in some areas, but it was a fun book to write. <laughs> My viewers will appreciate that. Um, <laughs> so, um, wow. Okay. And that's already, is it already out or is it about to be published? It's out. It's out. It's okay. out. It's been published. Um, it's on Amazon. It's on Amazon. In, um, in paperback and um, Kindle uh, ebook, di digital. Okay. And the sequel called Hashtag Justice Prevails follows, it should be out this fall. I'm hoping mid-October. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, keep us updated on one because I'd love to run a promo for it, like on oh, YouTube thanks. and um, Instagram and Twitter and all that. Awesome. Um, okay. <laughs> so uh, all of that said, if there was one thing you could tell your readers, what would it be? Hmm. I think, I think you have to take the bull by the horns and you know, carpe diem, seize the day with your life. You know, don't wait for things to happen because life passes by really fast, gets faster the older you get. And you never know when, you're, when your day is your last day. So if you want to do something, if you have a dream, pursue it, you know. Uh, you know, one of my favorite books of all time is called Illusions by Richard Bach. I love it. It's not a thick book. It's a very fast read, but it really makes you think. And one of the things that he says in there is... Um, you're never given a wish without being the, given the power to make it true. You may have to work for it, however. So I go love for that. It, people. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, okay, so our audience can find your book. Thank you for that, by the way. Our audience can find your book at hashtag hunted lives on Amazon in digital and paperback Correct. forms. Are you doing an audible version? Do you have plans for anything like that? I'm you know, people have asked me about for this book for hashtag hunted lies, but I've, I, 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 at some point I will, but I don't even know how to go about it. So it's something I'd have to figure out. I'd but, be happy to help you. Uh, really? with that, by the way, I don't do voiceovers because, mm -hmm. um, I ha actually have a speech impediment, but, um, never know. there's a person who I contract with on Fiverr, um, for really? some of my documentary style videos that I do. Um, and she might be open to doing a voiceover for your book. Wow. Oh, I'd definitely be interested in that information. Because uh, like I said, a few people have asked and more and more people, you know, listen to a book when they're driving. Yeah. You know, it's, it's easy way to hear a book. <laughs> 
Okay. Yeah, definitely get, get that information to me. And thank you so much again, JB, for having me on. I, this has been a real pleasure. <laughs> definitely. Um, well, thank you for joining me. Um, and of course, uh, you said that you would be open to giving a signed copy to one of my fans of hashtag Haunted Lives or Hunted Lives. Uh, all, they, all they need to do is subscribe to iLettercast.com. There's no purchase necessary to win. They just have to be 18 years or older. Um, and every month I randomly pick a mailing list subscriber to win a free signed book. So right. be on the lookout for your email announcing the winner. Um, I pay shipping and everything. So um, the viewer will get a brand new book right at their doorstep and you and I coordinate. So uh, basically all I need, uh, I'll, I'll send you the name and the mailing address and then um, okay. just PayPal for the, the cost of shipping. Um, I'm concerned about that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I appreciate that. It's a, uh, you know, it's kind of a pilot program for an indie author monthly subscription service that I really want to get going. Um, but of course, for I need my audience participation and actual interest in order to be like, yeah, this yeah. is worth investing in. Um, Absolutely. And what, where do they subscribe again? That was iLetter. iLetterCast.com. So I L E T T E R C A S T.com. Okay. Okay, and that's good. this is my personal website. That's in my newsletter I, as well. Yeah, you have a newsletter as well. I do. Well, where can they get access to that? Uh, well, they can go to my website, kdinojosa.com, k-a-d-y-i-n-o-j-o-s-a.com, and uh, they can subscribe to it there. Awesome. Um, well, thank you so much for joining me on this episode of Indie Author Connection. Um, I can't you. wait to read all of your books and. Um, to our viewers, thank you for joining us. Um, and remember, you met them here first on Any Author Connection podcast, where we bring you tomorrow's bestsellers today. Thanks, Jamie. Scene. <laughs> Fantastic. That was great. You did wonderful. Oh, thank you. Yeah. You make it very easy. If you enjoyed today's interview and want to hear more by other indie authors, feel free to hit that subscribe button. We post new content every month, as well as access to free and paid content by myself and the other authors interviewed here on the show at ilettercast.com. That's I-L-E-T-T-E-R-C-A-S-T dot com. If you subscribe to our newsletter, you actually get a weekly update on all of the content that I'm working on, as well as plenty of free and paid content by other awesome small indie creators. And if you want to be featured, just shoot me an email through that website. Thanks again for listening. And hey, you're wonderful. <laughs>